Our final guest speaker comes from South Africa, where she was imprisoned for her anti-apartheid activism. She has devoted a career to promoting social justice and human rights. In 2018, Amnesty International's Global Council named her chair of the organization's highest decision-making body that convenes human rights leaders from all over the world. In fact, it was through the efforts of Amnesty International that she secured her release from prison in South Africa. She movingly delivered the keynote address of the 49th Manzanar pilgrimage last year. And since 2016, she has served as a president and CEO of the Japanese American National Museum in Little Tokyo. Please welcome Anne Burroughs. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I'm so grateful for having been invited. I'm so grateful to be able to share today with you and to be able to be with you as we gather to remember the past and reflect on the consequence of history and its powerful lessons that are never more urgent or more present, frankly, than they are now. It's wonderful to be with you all as we commemorate the 77 years since the signing of Executive Order 9066, since we remember the history of forced removal and incarceration, the 31 years since the passage of the Civil Liberties Act, which Mitch so eloquently described, and then the 50th anniversary of the annual Manzanar pilgrimage, and we're of course so grateful to the Manzanar Committee for doing that for Warren, to Warren, to Bruce, to his mother, and to all the people who were involved in that, and then, of course, the two years since the dedication of this amazing monument. And we, have, we all feel such gratitude to all of us together for having done this. So these are extraordinarily, all of these, the moments that we're commemorating now are extraordinarily powerful and urgent reminders that now, more than ever, we must speak out against the rollback of rights and the constitutional violations that we're witnessing. That, are so powerful, that so powerfully parallel the ethnic and religious discrimination that led to the forced removal and the incarceration in 1942, which similarly today was in complete violation of some of the constitutional rights that are being rolled back now. So just eight months ago, when we celebrated and we commemorated the actual anniversary of the Civil, Civil Liberties Act with the help of, of Mitch Markey and in partnership with, with Go For Broke, we had quite an extraordinary display at the museum. And the centerpiece of that display was the original document on loan from the National Archives, which bore Pro President Reagan's signature. And we also had the pen which he used to sign that act into law. When we marked that anniversary, Janum and Japanese Americans all around the country, Japanese Americans, organizations and communities and people who support democracy celebrated the commitment of an entire community to push for redress and the act of that president who was willing to name the injustice of the incarceration for what it was and who in that instance we may not have agreed with all of his policies but who in that instance stood up for the principles on which this country was founded and who apologized for the great wrong that this country had wrought on its own citizens. And we're also starkly reminded of the contrast of that president's willingness to apologize and to name the wrong that could not have been more apparent. And we're also reminded of the current leadership that has brought into being a context where the relevance, where the relevance and the immediacy of that moment of history when the democratics and hum when the democratic and human rights of so many in this country were threatened and are threatened again. And when our obligation at Janum, at, at VJAM, with, where we stand on our own, we're not strong, but when we stand with other people all around the country, we have an obligation to shine a light on what can happen when any community is scapegoated and persecuted. That is, that's an obligation we all have and it's very urgent. It's amazing for me to stand next to this monument, to feel the physicality of this monument and to actually understand what it represents and to be with all of you who brought it into being and to be able to know that we have members of Youth Build here 
who will take those struggles forward and who will help to ensure that what happened all those years ago that this monument commemorates never happens again. It's a place, it's a monument, it's a place where history and the, me the memory of the incarceration will be preserved, where it will never be forgotten, where that apology that came from the American government will have meaning and a place that will always stand as a beacon on the corner of Lincoln and Venice, as a beacon against injustice, and a place where diversity and justice will be celebrated. By gathering today, we come together to affirm that commitment of the collective will, the sheer collective will of an entire community to ensure that history is never forgotten. So there's extraordinary power, there's extraordinary power in place, in this place in this place that we're all standing on. Over the years, the more I've learned about what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II, I've been so keenly aware of how powerfully their experiences, how powerfully the civil rights struggles, and how powerfully of the commitment that have fought those struggles, the powerfully of the commitment of the people who fought those struggles, how powerfully they've resonated with my own values and my own lifelong commitment to human rights and justice. And I was asked to talk a little bit about that, to be able to link with you some of the global issues, some of my own experience with where we are today and the experience that all of you have endured. But it was really only when I started working at Janum three years ago that I began to fully understand the dedication and the commitment and the extraordinary will of this community and communities of color and communities who are committed to democracy, what those struggles have meant and what those sacrifices have meant. So there too, there are very strong similarities and echoes with the path that I've chosen to take in my own life and the values that have driven me to make the choices that I've made. When I was 20 in my native South Africa, probably much the same age as the youth build folks who are with us, it was a very dark time in South Africa. It was a time of, of apartheid, and I know I'm willing to bet that there are people in this community sitting with, with us today who actually marched against apartheid. Wherever I go in the Japanese American community around this country, people come up to me and say, we were there with you. And I've also met with people who actually worked on my own case as Amnesty International members to secure my release. So the gratitude that we as people of South Africa and I personally as a former prisoner feel to all of you, that I owe to all of you is, is immeasurable. It's immeasurable. It was a very, very dark time in our country, again with similarities. When I joined the resistance movement to fight for democracy, I was actually in my teens and it took me through my 20s. And it was, a movement for, it was a movement that unified the majority of our country, that unified the world along with us. And it was a struggle for justice. It was a struggle against a constitution that enshrined racial, racial segregation as the law of the land. And I'm so reminded of the quote that, that Mitch shared with us, that in times of war, laws fall silent. And the South African government saw their their own struggle to uphold apartheid as being a war against justice and a war against freedom and a, and a war against democracy. So it enabled them to suspend the laws. The laws had never been just in South Africa, but it gave them license to suspend due process and it gave them license to enact many of the same things that we've seen, that we saw in 1942 and that we've seen in the history of the country since. But it was a very difficult time for us. We faced police brutality. Torture was routine for people in police custody. It was routine for political prisoners. There were troops in our townships. Disappearances and assassinations of activists and political leaders was, was pretty routine. And then in 1986, I was arrested along with thousands, hundreds of thousands of my comrades and fellow activists and held under emergency laws that allowed for indefinite detention without trial. So no charge, no trial. You were there, you did not know long, you did not know for how long you'd be there. The first few weeks of my detention, I was held in, sol in solitary confinement in a very small, 
police cell, which meant that I was completely shrouded from public attention. I had no access to my lawyers. And quite literally, along with activists all over the country, um, we were completely at the mercy of, of the South African police. My cell was about 12 by 8 in diameter. There was no place for me to wash my hands. There was a bathroom. The cell was completely feces and crusted, and the only place that I could shower was in the mortuary. And it was very difficult because we, every night we heard literally the pitched battles that were going on in the townships. We heard, we smelt the tear gas. And each day in the cell next to me, as people were being brought in and transferred to um, other political detention centers, they told me the stories of people who were killed, of my comrades that were killed. And I wasn't allowed to go into the mortuary until they cleared, until they cleared the mortuary. And of course, you never knew. And it was only afterwards that I realized how many of my own comrades in that struggle had lain on the same mortuary where I was allowed to shower. So after that, I was moved to a maximum security prison in in a town called, in a city called Port Elizabeth, to the same prison that Steve Biko was held in 10 years before. And of course, those of you who know South Africa's history and who were involved in that movement, that name speaks volumes. So I was held there without due process, um, and the security police were working up treason charges against me, which at the time bore extraordinary consequences. You know, there was a minimum of a 10-year sentence up to a life, life sentence. Because I was white, I knew that I would not be executed, but the death penalty was one of the, one of the consequences of treason. But my life would have been very difficult, very, very different, if they had been successful in bringing those treason charges against me, if I had not had, if Amnesty International had not taken up my case to help to secure my release, release and if it hadn't been for other South African leaders that had worked tirelessly to do that. So that work by Amnesty, by solidarity groups, by people who were willing to use their voices and their time to stand up for me and for other activists meant that when I was released, I was kept safe. I thought that I would be rearrested, but I wasn't. When I was finally arrested, I was released with a banning order, which was a restriction on my movement, what I could say, what I could publish and also really of great consequence. Um, we had, we st the apartheid laws were still on the books. So there was an act called the Mixed Marriages Act, similarly to, the, similarly to the miscegenation laws in this country all those decades ago, where you were not allowed to marry somebody who was not white. And my partner at the time was, was not white, and he eventually became my husband and the father of my child. But we had to wait for those laws. We had to wait another four years for those laws to be to be um, to be overturned before we were able to live together, let alone to marry. So now I find myself a Janum at a time of extraordinary divisiveness and uncertainty in this country, when so many of those hard-won civil rights protections are again under threat. When we see, sometimes we aren't even aware, but some of it is very public of how the judiciary is being reshaped. We know the extent to which public policy is being driven by bigotry. There's urgent work for us to do. There's urgent work for us all to stand together. If history teaches us nothing else, it's that rhetoric can normalize division and exclusion, and how easily that same rhetoric can drive acceptance and submissiveness, how easily history is repeated. We're once again at this time witnessing the corrosive power of prejudice and unfettered discrimination, the return of explicit racism to public discourse, the shredding of truth, and the consequences of public policy that's shaped by hatred. It was also the self-same climate that made possible the incarceration. And in the last two years, we've seen a stripping of rights, those constitutionally guaranteed rights that this monument reminds us that we have to stand up for. Those rights that are rights. They're not privileges that can be withdrawn and bestowed at whim. Those are rights that are enshrined in the Constitution. And if we don't stand up for them, they will become privileges that can be withdrawn. 
white supremacy we've seen has crept out of the shadows. It's in our streets, in, it's in our public discourse. The language of prejudice has become policy. Truth is perverted. And most damaging of all, that racial hatred has made violence permissible again. We can reel them off. We stand here at a time when thousands of people on our southern borders are being criminalized and vilified, when they're being stripped of their rights to seek asylum, which is guaranteed to them by the Constitution, when their children are taken away from them and incarcerated simply because their parents are exercising their right to seek asylum. We're closing our borders on refugees. We cannot sit silent as these children are being held in cages. We cannot sit silent as the children are behind barbed wire, the same barbed wire, the same suspension of the laws that held some of you and your, your parents in concentration camps. We can't stand silent as what's happening now to immigrant families and children. We cannot stand silent in the face of what history will surely judge as a crime against humanity. If nothing else, history teaches us that these freedoms are fragile and they're never more at risk than when we fail to confront injustice, when we fail to stand up for justice. When I look back at my own history, I feel extraordinarily proud that I flew the flag of revolution and that I was, part to be a I was able to be part of a movement that saw liberation in my country, that brought the promise of justice and democracy and an end to one of the most oppressive regimes of the 20th century. But I also know that even although we accomplished that, we would not have been able to move forward to bring our democracy to life if we hadn't had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which Warren referred to earlier. They're very similar. They're, there are a lot of similarities, but there are also very there are also a lot of differences. But I think that the important thing, the important lesson of this, and this is a lesson which you're all able to appreciate and understand, and that I hope that as we move into expanding this discourse across the country, I hope that we'll all remember and take the key lesson from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was that we were all less whole because of apartheid. Black people suffered years of oppression, while most white people who lived in privilege, we all lived in privilege, but we also became less compassionate, and we became less humane, and we therefore became less human. So we didn't have redress, but there was an opportunity for us to come to terms with the truth, that truth that is so powerful, that is almost more powerful than anything else. And we were able to effect a forgiveness that allowed our country and our communities in this time of incredible divisiveness to come together, to come to terms with the past, to recover our sense of humanity, and to imagine what a new beginning could look like, and to be able to usher in a true democracy. The Japanese American, I don't need to tell you because you know of this, you've lived this, but it's a beacon to the strength of democracy. It's a beacon to when rights are withheld and it's a beacon to when democracy survives, and it's a beacon to when a community comes together and stands up for rights. It's a beacon to when people of different opinions can come together and have, a, have civil discourse and affect something that's quite extraordinary, to affect this, to affect redress. We know, thank you, we know that democracy dies when truth is distorted, so we have to stand up for that. We know that democracy dies when lies shroud the facts and people cease to engage honestly and critically, and when we cease to hold leaders and policy to account. Truth is what matters more than anything else. And that truth, along with that optimism, is the strongest weapon of any democracy. Because it's that optimism, it's that commitment, that belief in the future, that belief in a, in a, in a, in a, in a just society that impels us, that inspires us, that motivates us to question, to raise up our voices, not to be silent and to question always, to question our political leaders and always never ever to allow ourselves to be tolerant when protest and dissent is silenced. 
There's great hope, I believe, regardless of what your political position may be. But there's great hope, I believe, despite the difficulties, despite the discrimination, and despite the dissent. There's great hope in the resistance, and the resistance can take many forms. The resistance can be simply engaging in a civil conversation with somebody who has a different opinion than you do. And that's why gathering together, as we do, on the corner of Venice and Lincoln, where we can stand up and we can stand proud for those things, is really quite extraordinary. So I'm honored to have been with all of you, and I'm so honored to have been able to tell you a little bit about myself, and I'm so honored to stand shoulder to shoulder with all of you. Thank you. Our closing speaker will be Suzanne. She is Suzanne Thompson. She is a charter member of the VGM Committee and a founding member of the Venice Arts Council. With special words of appreciation to a Girl Scout Gold Award awardee and a special appreciation to Betsy Goldman of the 2019 Venice Community Calendar. Thank you, Suzanne. I have some good news, and that is a couple of things, of, three things I want to bring to your attention. Who was here last year? Raise your hand. What do you notice that's really different about this corner? The wall, the wall. The wall is gone! Yay! Okay, so now we're gonna make it even look better. So thank you to you community members, you know who you are, and all that work to make that happen. And thank you, um, Councilman Bonin's office as well. Uh, I'm wearing my little Girl Scout button here that's over 50 years old, because one day through the uh, Buddhist temple that um, Phyllis works, uh, worships at, the Girl Scout troop 5325 decided that they would be a part of the maintenance and come and clean the monument. So after doing that, this young woman, Lindsay Kochi, uh, Kochiyama, Kojima, decided she wanted to get her uh, Gold Star Award through her Girl Scout troop. So she made a project out of the monument and she did a, several things. One thing she did was interview the people that are on the monument, the, inter the people that were interned. So th we have some archival documentary footage of that. And also, she created this badge and a questionnaire, an interactive uh, piece. This was part of her, her uh, Gold Star project for people to come to the monument fill out the questionnaire and then send it back to her and she would send them this beautiful badge. Uh, is Arnold still here? Where's Arnold? Arnold's right here. He's put it on the front of his cap. So if, if you're interested in knowing more about that, please see me. And then it went on further. After she did that, she decided to do a book. So she did a book for her project, which we're really thrilled. And I'll share it with you right here. And it's called The Corner of Lincoln and Venice. And she, she wrote the text and she also illustrated the book. And I had the um, privilege of going to the French school, the Equalier Claire Fontaine French School here in Venice, where she presented this to toddlers. And we um, colored the obelisk, which is were cut out ahead of time. And the kids colored them and she read the book to them. So we're really, really pleased that she did that. So it's part of our educational outreach. And also, the um, Betsy Goldman and Paul and Steve put together uh, an annual calendar that they do. Many of you may have already seen this. But they featured the VJAM and the Japanese American community in Venice. So we're really pleased to see that the monument is going out into the community. And, the mo and so any schools that you have, that, you, in, especially in Venice, we really want to get this word out to the community at large because this is bigger than just the Japanese American community, bigger than Venice. It's something that's affecting all of us in our lives, especially today. So thank you for coming, and Phyllis, thank you so much. And there's also another person I wanted to acknowledge, Charmaine Jefferson. She's a consultant. She's a former um, director of the Afro-American Museum. And she also has some wonderful stories that we hope in the future we'll be able to share with you about the Afro-American community and the Japanese American community and what happened in Los Angeles and how those communities came together. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much.